Hello and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. It's hard enough to deal with spirits in your own home, but it adds insult to injury when they start to bother you in other people's homes. Can't they just choose a place and stick with it? Tonight, we'll get the answer to that question. And spoiler alert, the answer is no. Spirits will do as they darn well please. So we might as well just enjoy the stories. So sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, together. Before I went to medical school, I did a year at pharmacy school. I was broke and my group of friends and I were always in need of money and were always seeking out new places to study, away from the undergrads. One day we got an email from the dean about a dog slash house sitting situation and quickly realized it was located in one of the richest areas of town. A woman and her husband, an NFL referee, were going on a trip overseas and would be gone for two weeks. The woman said they'd be completely off the grid, unable to be contacted while they were away. We decided to jump at the opportunity. There was a pool we could study by, and we'd take shifts spending the night. Our job began with an hour-long orientation, during which time the woman went through exactly what she expected for the $500 she'd pay. She made each of us extensive checklists on how to take care of her mini poodle. It was all a bit melodramatic, but worth it, or so we thought. There was something very strange about the woman. I can't even describe it. She gave off an extremely dark and creepy vibe, just one of those people that make you feel inherently uncomfortable when they're around you. The entire house gave off the most eerie feeling as well. I've never felt anything like it. The weirdness began with one of my friends showing up to her shift and finding all of the doors unlocked, even though we were certain that we'd locked up the night before. She was spooked and texted us about it. She made her boyfriend stay with her that night, and at one point, the house speaker system started blaring Native American tribal music. Interestingly enough, there was a park directly behind the house with Indian burial mounds. She recorded the music and sent it to us. When another friend showed up for her shift, the garage door was up. She figured one of us had just forgotten to put it down, but that wasn't the case. She went inside and all of the lights were on in the entire house and the heat was on full blast. The house was hotter than the sun. Now we were all spooked and dreading the fact that we had to do this for two more weeks and couldn't contact the owners. My friend decided to call the cops because we were convinced someone was breaking in. They came, searched the whole house, found no one and nothing out of place, then left. Some of the neighbors came out to see what all the commotion was about. I asked if they had any similar experiences, and they all answered with a resounding no. Even more odd, none of them ever met the husband and wife before, despite the fact that they had lived there for years. They also were unaware that they had a dog because they'd never seen it outside or being walked, despite her strict rule that we had to walk the dog four times a day. The day after we called the cops, it was my turn to do the night shift. I made my boyfriend tag along. When we arrived, the garage door was up and the door to the house from the garage was ajar. I'd had enough at that point and decided to call the police again. My boyfriend and I were standing outside by his car preparing to call the cops when his car alarm went off. Now, this had never happened before. We both pulled out our cell phones to call the police and they proceeded to go from 80% power to dead right before our eyes. We walked to the neighbor's house to use their phone. Again, the police came and found nothing out of the ordinary and left. After they left, we went inside because I'd left a textbook in the upstairs bedroom. When we got up there, 
the bed wasn't made. I jokingly texted my friend who had the previous night's shift, teasing her about being a slob. To my horror, she swore that she made the bed before leaving. Over the next two weeks, we were all terrified to go back there, but also we knew the dog needed feeding and walking, so we did, but we refused to spend the night. How would the owner know anyway? We wanted to take the dog home to care for him there and leave the house to itself, but we were all living in our respective sorority houses at the time, and they didn't allow pets. Plus, we were afraid to take the dog home, even if we could, because she had been so specific and meticulous in her instructions about how to care for the dog. We didn't want to get on the bad side of this crazy woman. So we took turns walking him in the morning, afternoon, and evening before it got dark, and made sure to always have someone go with us. This was all definitely a drain, having to drive over there numerous times a day, sometimes in between classes. We had no idea it would require so much intensive time and effort when we agreed to do this. When the owner returned from her trip, we met with her at her house, thinking that she had no idea about the things that were happening when she was away. But she immediately asked why we hadn't stayed every night. It didn't take long to realize that the house had security cameras all over, and she had reviewed the footage extensively before meeting with us. She seemed completely unbothered by the fact that the police had searched her home twice, but instead yelled at us and called us names for not following her directions. She then refused to pay us. We were so terrified of her, we just wanted to get out of there. Now this part is so strange. Remember she said that her husband was going on the trip with her? Well, her husband refereed a game during the time she claimed to have been overseas with him. We actually saw him on camera. We never met him, but we knew his name and we had seen pictures of him throughout the house. I wish I had more proof that she never went on that trip in the first place. Ironically, her husband just recently retired from the NFL after they threatened to fire him for a long history of making bad calls. I thought about it being a scam just to get free house and dog sitting services, but I just can't make any sense of why a very wealthy woman would want to scam college kids out of their 500 hard-earned dollars. I guess you can be rich and petty. We let our dean know about the experience, so he wouldn't advertise the opportunity for any kids in the future. We went to college in the Deep South, and honestly, after seeing the movie Parasite, it made me wonder if she was holding someone prisoner in the home, and they had finally gotten the opportunity to mess with the family when they left the country. I suppose it could have been a maintenance crew member that made a duplicate key, maybe trying to run us off so they could have the place to themselves for two weeks. For a while we were convinced it was a squatter, but wouldn't the owner have seen that on the security footage and told us? I have no idea. To this day, we still talk about how strange it all was. I've since moved from that state, but my friend still lives there. She recently drove by the house and said she saw nothing out of the ordinary. I also checked the tax assessor's website because I'm a sleuth. And it appears that they still own the property. Was it human or paranormal? I honestly have no idea. Regardless, it was a terrifying experience and I still can't make any sense of it. I was spending the night at my friend's house when we were teenagers. He lived with his mother, grandmother, and younger brother, who were all asleep in other parts of the house. We were still talking and playing video games. His room was a large den at the back of the house, facing the living room up front. I was sitting facing him, and he was sitting facing me and the living room behind me. It was around 12.30 in the morning. While we were talking, his face suddenly drained of color and his eyes got huge. I spun around to see what he was looking at, but I saw nothing. He said it looked like there had been someone standing in the living room, that they appeared out of nowhere, then disappeared a moment later. 
we walked into the living room, which was dark except for the light coming through the window from the street light right outside of his house. We saw no evidence that there was anyone else in the room, and for a moment, we calmed down. Suddenly, we heard the living room window next to us shatter. When we looked up, there was a shadow of a person standing outside in front of the window outlined on the curtains. Also, the dogs in every nearby house began to bark. The shadow moved across the front of the window and towards the front door. When it passed by the door, every dog stopped barking immediately, except for one that let out a single whimper. Then, silence. For some reason, we ran to the door, threw it open, and gave chase. In the direction the shadow headed, there were no cross streets or alleys for at least a thousand yards. The street was also very well lit, but we saw nothing and heard nothing. No running footsteps, no neighbors coming to see what all the commotion was, no cars, nothing. It was graveyard still and silent. We moved down the street for about four or five houses, checking to make sure that no one was hiding. We soon grew uneasy, though, and decided to head back to the house. Things got even more disturbing when we got back to the house. We checked the front window to see how bad the damage was, only to find that every single window pane was still intact. No broken glass inside or out. We checked the rest of the house, the car, and a couple of the neighbors' homes as well. No broken glass anywhere. Through all of this, we still saw and heard no sign of any other human or animal stirring on the block. The next day, we talked to his family and several of the neighbors about it. No one recalls hearing any glass breaking or dogs barking or any disturbance at all that night. If my friend hadn't experienced it all with me, I might think I'd dreamt the whole thing. I don't know if any of this is paranormal exactly, but I definitely never found a way to explain it. When I was younger, I was sitting in the den with my two cousins, two sisters, and my brother. We were all taking turns playing Mario Kart. My younger sister and I were sitting across from one another at the coffee table when I turned to see an old man, all in white, with long white hair and a long white beard, with his mouth wide open. I stared at it for about five seconds, then looked away. My brain could not register what I was seeing. I looked back, and it was gone. I never told anyone about this, because my grandparents had told me in the past that I was silly about other experiences that I had, and said it was just my imagination. Years later, as adults, my brother, younger sister, one of my cousins, and my aunt were all sitting at the kitchen table telling stories about scary things that have happened to us. I told that story, and my younger sister said, No, that was me. We argued about it for a bit until we came to the conclusion that we both saw the same thing that night and never told anyone. My aunt then told us about the old man they called Uncle Orville, who haunted that same house, and I feel like it was him. According to my aunt, this Uncle Orville ghost answered the phone once when my grandparents and their kids were out for the day, telling my aunt's friend that he was house-sitting. Now not only was nobody house-sitting, but being an extremely small town, they knew there was nobody by that name living there. I was on leave from the army, and my father and Carol, my stepmother, had just moved into a big, beautiful house. This was my first time visiting the new home, and I brought a good buddy along, Chris, who I served with in the army and was also on leave. We arrived, grabbed our bags, and walked in. My dad asked me what I thought of the new house. My first reaction? I turned to him and said, I'm not staying here. He was confused, 
but I was serious. I was not staying in that house. I had a weird feeling. The house felt cold. Not a physical cold, more like when the hair on the back of your neck stands up. It felt like something was watching me, like we were all its prey. I went out with my mate Chris, got drunk, and Chris slept in the house, but I slept in the car. The next morning, Chris came out to the car, sat in the passenger seat, and looked at me. He said he was uncomfortable, but didn't know why. He also had a weird feeling about the house, and was pretty shook up. We forgot about it and decided to just try and enjoy the rest of our leave. Later in the week, I phoned my stepmother, who was running errands. She answered the phone, but I couldn't hear her. Hello? Hello, Carol, can you hear me? There was this weird static coming from the phone, but it was like no static I'd ever heard before. The tone and rate kept changing. I could hear a distant voice, but I couldn't make out what it was saying because it was lost in the static. I put the call on speakerphone so the others could hear it. Hey, Dad and Chris, you hear this? They both looked confused. We listened carefully, but we couldn't make out any words. Then, the phone call ended. A few hours later, when we got back home, I asked my stepmother, Hey, what was that on the phone earlier? What do you mean, she said. Well, you answered the phone and there was all that static. What was that that we heard? What are you talking about, she said. I left my phone in the bedroom. I haven't had it all day. I forgot it at home. After that, things took a turn. A few nights later, Dad and Carol went to their bedroom to go to bed, only to find the bedroom door locked from the inside. Chris decided to help by climbing out of the second floor bathroom window and across the eaves to climb into their bedroom window. When he reached the bedroom window, he stopped and looked down at me, white as a sheet. After a long pause, he climbed into the bedroom window and opened the door. Later that night, I asked him what happened up there. What got him so freaked out? He said, you remember how you said you didn't like the house? I'm beginning to agree with you. When I got to the window, I saw something in that room. I couldn't see it clearly, but something was definitely in that room. There was a feeling of something sinister in that house. I didn't say much, though. I just brushed it off. I didn't want to freak myself out more than I already was. Later that week, we were all getting ready to go out. Carol called out to me, asking me to bring her the hairdryer. I popped my head around the corner and said, I'm sorry, what? She spun around and let out a little scream. She was panicked and said, Who was just sat next to me? I thought you were next to me. No, I was in the kitchen. But she insisted, No, you were next to me. You put your hand on my back. I felt it. Carol was freaked out. I was freaked out. I hated that house so much. Chris and I were meant to go camping, but I wanted to work this out. So instead of a camping trip, Chris, my dad, Carol, and I decided to stay in. Carol invited her daughter over to have a takeaway. At bedtime, there was loud banging up and down the staircase. I got a text from my dad saying that Chris and I should shut up. I texted back that it wasn't us. Then Carol texted her daughter to see if it was her, but she texted back, I thought it was you. The banging continued on and off all night. Whenever we went to have a look, it stopped, but when we walked away, it would start up again. My leave ended and I was back at my army base and I got a call telling me that they were moving from that house and asked if I could come and help pack. I asked why they were moving, and they said the house wasn't right. Weird stuff kept happening all the time. Doors slamming, stuff going missing, and cupboard doors opening and closing on their own. The last straw came when my stepmother heard someone in the kitchen. She thought it was her son Max coming home early from school, making himself something to eat. 
She got up and walked into the kitchen, where she saw a figure standing near the sink. But it wasn't Max. When she saw it, moments later, it just disappeared. That was the day she decided to leave. A few days later, we started to pack. The neighbors popped in and asked if they were moving. They said yes, that they'd found another place. The neighbor then said, yeah, most people don't stay here too long. We've heard all kinds of strange stories coming from former owners. I asked about the house and its history, if anyone was harmed or killed in the house. But nobody knew anything other than that weird stuff happened there. I couldn't find much history on the house when I looked, just that the street was very old and most of the houses were built on land that once held older homes that were then demolished to make way for new homes. All I know is that whatever was in that house did not like us being there. The worst part, though, was that it only struck out when Carol was in the company of others. Did the entity want Carol all to itself? Did it see us as a threat? I don't know, and I don't want to know anything more about that house or what is in it, and I certainly didn't look any deeper into the history for fear of what I might find. This happened a while ago, when I was 10 years old. At that time, my mom had just gotten out of a relationship with her boyfriend, and we had to move out. Having nowhere to go, we temporarily stayed with my Nana. On New Year's Day, I really had to go to the bathroom, but someone was taking a shower in the upstairs bathroom. There was another one in the unfinished basement, but it was full of storage boxes, and it didn't have a door, and the lights didn't work. But I couldn't wait, so I had to use it. So I turned on the lights at the top of the stairs. The bathroom was directly facing the stairs, so there was enough ambient light. After I finished my business, I was about to head upstairs. To my horror, I saw a translucent man standing at the top of the stairs, staring down and smirking at me. This man kind of looked like my uncle, but in his early 20s, I couldn't move. I could tell he wasn't a real live person, but I could still see him. Eventually, he just disappeared in the blink of an eye. I knew something wasn't right about him. Somehow, I just knew something terrible had happened to this guy. Later that day, I told my mom about it. My Nana's house was a semi, and my mom was good friends with the couple who lived next door. One day, my mom was talking to them on the porch, and she mentioned what I saw. As soon as my mom told them what it looked like, the woman started to freak out. Apparently, she had a brother who died a few years ago in a fire that he set in his own house. He was only 21, and the woman always said that my uncle reminded her of him because they looked so much alike. Later, my mom showed me a picture of him, and that's exactly who I saw. It was probably the weirdest paranormal thing I've ever experienced. When I was around 20 years old, I house sat for my aunt and uncle for a few nights when they were away on vacation. They had two large dogs at the time, a Rottweiler and a Black Lab. I'd sleep there overnight, feed them, and let them out in the morning. I'd done this for them before and was used to the dogs acting up while my aunt and uncle were away. They'd bark at nothing, stare at certain spots in the house, and randomly run, barking at the door. But the house was in a very wooded area and there were deer and bear around, so I didn't think much of it. One night, my little sister wanted to stay overnight with me, so she slept in my cousin's room and I slept on the couch. At some point in the night, I woke up with sleep paralysis, which didn't necessarily scare me because I'd had it before. This time, though, I felt a strange sensation in my face, like my entire jawbone was vibrating. I figured I must have fallen asleep with my phone under my pillow, so, unable to move, 
I scanned the room, looking for my phone. I saw it sitting across from me on a table. I'd had some strange episodes of sleep paralysis before, so I just waited it out and fell back to sleep. Later that night, I woke up again, this time because one of the dogs had climbed up on the couch and was lying behind me, nudging me off the side. Now, these were big dogs, and I could feel its weight pushing up hard against me. I was tired and didn't feel like moving or kicking the dog off, so I just tried to fall back to sleep. But I kept waking up, getting pushed further and further off the edge of the couch, until I almost fell off at one point. Frustrated and exhausted, I shoved my back against the dog, trying to get it to move, but it wouldn't budge. After what felt like a couple of hours of getting nudged off the couch by this bulk of dead weight, I gave up and went into my cousin's room to sleep with my sister, where I found her and both dogs in the room with the door closed, sound asleep. When my aunt and uncle came back, I told them what happened, but they didn't seem surprised. Turns out, two people died in that house before they moved in. Someone overdosed in the living room where I was sleeping, and a little boy who lived in the house died on my cousin's birthday. His bedroom was adjacent to the living room, but the wall had been torn down to make one big room. I certainly hope you all enjoyed those stories as much as I did. If so, leave a comment below. Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll be an official member of the Family of Darkness and be sent that weekly party invitation directly. Everyone is invited to the party, Thursdays at 5 p.m., right here. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends. <laughs>